Welcome to the third lecture of the Prime Minister's lecture series. I would like to request everybody to please take their seats. We are soon going to begin uh, this afternoon's program. And may I also request everybody before the program begins to put their mobile phones on silent mode. Kindly take your seats. So at the very outset, I would like to request the Honorable Chairman of Executive Council of NMML, Sri Nipen Mishra ji, to give his welcome address on this occasion. Sir. Sri Nainan, our Vice Chairman, Dr. Surya Prakash, privileged, very distinguished presence here, our guests, particularly, we feel very honored and in fact feel very recognized that the family of late Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri, it responded very positively to our invitation and their family has come. We would especially like to thank you for being here. Thank you once again. When we were thinking about the speaker for this occasion, there was, there were two views. A suggestion was that we should be looking for someone who has served with him or in his party. There was also a view that given his values for very high ethical standards, we should be looking for an intellectual who necessarily should not be seen as belonging to this party or that party but who is only interested in the development of this country. And we finally narrowed on Mr. Nainan, a very eminent economist, who kindly agreed to deliver a lecture on respected Sri Lal Bahadur Sastri the subject being the man who died too soon. Sri Nainan doesn't need any introduction in this gathering, but then it is customary to mention few of his many achievements. He's an economist, author, and journalist. He guided as chairman of Business Standard for about a quarter of a century. He has also been the editor of Business Standard. The other newspapers with he was associated were Economic Times and Business World. He was also executive editor of India Today. He has been president of Editors Guild of India, Chairman of the Media Committee of the Confederation of Indian Industry, 
chairman of the Society for Environment, Environmental Communication, which publishes Down to Earth magazine, and member of the Board of Trade. I may also mention that I may have attended six, seven pre-budget sessions with economists of the Prime Minister that was there. And of course, Mr. Nainan was always a permanent invitee to those discussions. He has served on the board of Sri Ram School and a member of Indo-German Consultative Group, as well as a trustee of Aspen Institute of India. He's a recipient of many awards, including the B.D. Goenka Award for Excellence of Journalism. Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial Fund awarded him a Nehru Fellowship for 2013-14, his well-known book is Turn of the Tartoise, which looks at the future of India. We are here today to, in manner, pay our tribute and recall the contribution of late Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri Ji, our very dear Prime Minister. As we all know, he was born on October 2, 1904 at Mughalsarai, a small railway town near Varanasi. His father was a school teacher not very well off financially. Also died very early. And then Sastriji was sent for initial education to his uncle. His pet name was Nanne, the small but great man. and often walked many miles to schools, at times without shoes. Lal Bahadur Shastri Ji was 16 when Gandhi Ji gave a clarion call to his countrymen to join the non-cooperation movement. It was only natural that Sastriji will be on the forefront. He had by then joined Kashi Vidyapit in Varanasi, an institution which was already building up the nationalists. There he came under the influence of nationalist intellectuals of the country. Perhaps many may not know that Sastri was his bachelor's degree and that was obtained in Vidya Peet. But this is stuck in the minds of the people as part of his name. In 1930, Mahatma Gandhi undertook Dandi March and broke the Imperial Salt Law. The symbolic gesture set the whole country ablaze. How could Sastriji be left he threw himself into the struggle for freedom and with feverish energy, he led many defiant campaigns and in the process, he spent about seven years in jail. It was the fire of the freedom struggle that molded his personality of being selfless, higher simplicity, high ethics, and extreme sacrifice. After independence, he held many charges, starting with parliamentary secretary in the home state of Uttar Pradesh and rose to the position of home minister. 
In Delhi in 1951, he held after that several portfolios in the Union Cabinet, Minister for Railways, Minister for Transport Communication, Minister for Commerce Industry, Home Minister, and during Nehruji's illness, he was Minister without portfolio. Many of us who were young remember his resignation from the post of the Minister for Railways because he felt responsible for a railway accident in which many lives were lost. The unprecedented measure or the step was greatly appreciated by the parliament and the country. The then Prime Minister, Sri Nehru, is speaking in parliament on the incident. Extol Lal Bahadur Shastri's integrity and high ideals. He said he was accepting the resignation because it would set an example in ethical propriety and parliamentary convention, and not because Lal Bahadur Ji was in any way responsible for what had happened. More than 30 years of dedicated public service behind Sri Shastri Ji, in the course of the period, he was known as a man of great integrity, competence, humble, tolerant, great inner strength and res resoluteness. He was a man of the people who understood their pulse. He was a man of vision who led the country towards progress. Above all, and which is very important in our country, he was a great consensus builder. During his prime ministership of about 19 months, Prime Minister Sastri carved a place in history. His role in handling food shortage of the 1960 and launch of the Green Revolution will always be remembered by the country. His slogan, Jai Jawan Jai Kisan, galvanized the whole nation and continues to do so even now. Before I conclude, few words about this institution where we are all gathering, we have collected here. As you all know, this program is part of the Pradhan Mantri Sangrahale's commitment for academic pursuits. This Sangrahale is a tribute to every Prime Minister of India since independence and a narrative record of how each one has contributed to the development of our nation over the last 75 years. It is a history of collective effort and powerful evidence of the creative success of Indian democracy. The Sangrahale, which was inaugurated by Honorable Prime Minister on 14th April 2022, has emerged as one of the top destination for Delhi Wallas and tourists to visit, and from 21st April 2022 till 30th June, more than 5 lakh people have already visited the Sangrahale. <laughs> Today's lecture on our beloved Sastriji is part of the academic initiatives of Pradhan Mantri Sangrahale, the inaugural lecture of the Prime Minister series was delivered on 20th January 23 by former President of India, Sri Ramnath Kovind. The second lecture in that series on Jawaharlal Nehru was delivered by Honorable Governor of Kerala, Sri Arif Mohammad Khan on 19th April 2023, we are greatly privileged and honored to have this third lecture on late Sri Lal Bahadur Shastriji from Sri Nainan. Welcome, sir. Thank you.
thank you very much, sir, for uh, delivering the welcome address. And may I now invite Mr. T. N. Nainan to give his lecture, sir. Rupendra Mishra ji, Dr. Surya Prakash, Mr. Anil Shastri, and other members of the Shastri family, and friends. When a good friend of mine received the invitation to this lecture, he sent me an email to say that it was news to him that I was an expert on Shastri. I replied that, of course, I was not an expert, but I had been given the choice of speaking on Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, or Shastri. And given our contentious political climate, I thought Shastri was the safest option. <laughs> the truth is that I have had no direct personal experience of Mr. Shastri since I never met him. I was in school in Calcutta when he was Prime Minister. And what I remember of that period is the excitement of the Indo-Pakistan War. Other than that, my memory is of Shastri's visit to the city, his cavalcade, and Shastri himself apparently riding in a large open limousine through the city streets. The next morning, the newspapers reported that since the Prime Minister was so short, he had stood on a stool inside the car so that he would be standing taller and people could bet, get a better look at him. I don't know if that was really the case. You know how reliable newspaper reports are. <laughs> so I've had to base this lecture on entirely secondary sources, two and a half biographies written on Shastri, and I say half because one person wrote two biographies, and the first one was only half-baked. Um, I've also relied on the memoirs of civil servants and editors of the time, accounts of the war, and so on. These accounts don't always agree on the details, so I have used my judgment and chosen the version that seemed the most plausible. I hope I've made the right choices. Now to turn to the man in focus this evening. I start with a broad assessment. Then I look at Shastri's early life, some of which, um, and later life also, uh, Mr. Mishra has given you a brief glimpse of. And then Shastri's entry into public life how he came to be viewed as Nehru's most likely successor, the rivals and critics who stood in the way, his record as prime minister in the context of the India of the time, and I think the context was important. Examples of his responses under pressure, Tashkent, the what if question in case he had lived longer, and the conclusion. Um, so I start with my assessment of Shastri. Most of us tend to underestimate someone who is short and small of build, and Shastri himself used to make fun of it. And especially if he's also mild-mannered. And so Lal Bahadur Shastri was easy to underestimate. He was underrated by Pakistan's president, General Ayub Khan, a tall Pathan who thought that such a small, weak man would fail the test of a war. He was underrated also by his political peers who thought he could be managed by a collective leadership. And what wasn't obvious was that there was steel underneath that soft exterior. He was not confrontational, but always his own man. Shastri's other strength was that he was transparent in his dealings, which helped to build trust. On top of that, he had the moral strength of his integrity. 
He was the only Prime Minister to die penniless. All that he left behind for his family was an unpaid car loan. Most importantly, and I'd like to emphasize this, he was a man with remarkably good judgment. The country would have done well to have him live and serve longer. It is a tragedy that he died so soon. Those are my broad assessments. Let us now turn to his life story. Lal Bahadur was born and bred in poverty. His father died early, and his maternal grandfather, who had taken charge of the family, didn't live much longer. So young Lal Bahadur Shastri was moved to the homes of various uncles, some more kindly and some less. He neither pitied his condition nor made political capital out of it later. When the inevitable myth maker said that he went to school every day by swimming across the Ganga, Shastri gently told the questioner that it happened only once, when he did not have the money to pay for the ferry. One of his biographers records that Lal Bahadur's education was initiated under the, at the age of four under the care of a Malvi, as apparently was the custom. The man chosen was from a neighboring village who taught in a railway school at Mughal Sarai. He introduced Lal Bahadur to both Urdu and Tezib or social etiquette. In due course, a compendium of Mirza Ghalib's poetry would become Lal Bahadur's constant companion. His favorite poem by Ghalib spoke of a life of solitude. Before long, the country was caught up in the ferment of the freedom movement. Lal Bahadur was just 16 when he responded to Gandhi's call at a meeting in Varanasi, asking students to leave their schools and colleges and join the non-cooperation movement. This was just a few months short of his final school exams. He faced very natural pressure from his family to write the exams and get a job that would improve their straightened circumstances. But the teenager chose to become a Congress volunteer. Over the next 25 years, he was to be arrested seven times and spend a total of nine years behind bars. But though he had left school, as Mr. Ji said, he did later join the Kashi Vidya Peet when it was set up. And on graduation after four years, Lal Bahadur earned the title of Shastri, or one who knows the Shastras. This became the handle by which he would henceforth be known. Earlier in school, young Lal Bahadur had given up his Kaya's surname, caste name. His formal education completed, Shastri's next step when he entered public life was to meet Lala Lajpat Rai in Lahore and join the Servants of People's Society, of which he later became a life member. His initial task was Harijan uplift in Muzaffar Nagar. When Lajpat Rai was succeeded by Purushottam Das Tandon, who moved his base to Allahabad, Shastri was appointed his assistant and also elected a member of the city's municipal board. Lahabad's leading politician other than Tandon was of course Jawaharlal Nehru. As is well known, the two had very different worldviews and never got along. Yet Shastri earned the trust of both and worked closely with both. Tandon read Shastri accurately when he described him as, and I quote, a genius in striking balances and achieving compromises, unquote. He also saw, quote, behind his humility, a rock of toughness, unquote. The young assistant proved to be an efficient and hardworking political operative. So he rose step by step through district and state politics to the national stage. As the General Secretary of the Congress, he took charge 
uh, of the party's successful election campaign in 1952 and then again in 1957. Shastri was also one of the key players in choosing Congress candidates for the 1962 parliamentary elections. As government minister, Shastri undertook what came to be, to what came to me as a surprising number of initiatives when he was in charge at different times of the railways, commerce and industry, and finally, home affairs. In the last post, he became a successful troubleshooter, dousing linguistic communal fires in Assam, tackling the agitation for a Punjabi suba, and assuaging concern about language policy in the South. Later, as minister without portfolio, he also tackled the crisis in Kashmir over the prophet's missing hair, and then effected a much needed change in the state's leadership. The result of this track record and his personality traits was that Shastri came to have the short odds when it came to succeeding Nehru. This is despite there being no shortage of stalwarts in the Congress party. But, but Shastri had the advantage of coming from the political heartland. He was known to be a workaholic who applied himself seriously to any task he had a good track record as a political operative, an active minister, and a successful problem solver. He also had a pleasing, non-confrontational style of operation and was easier to deal with than someone like the stern Moraji Desai. So while he was not a visionary or a man with original ideas who launched grand projects, Shastri had general acceptability. Nor was he an auditor, but it helped that he spoke simply and from the heart. For all these reasons, he enjoyed Nehru's confidence more than most others. It was said of him, somewhat fancifully, I think, that he had no enemies. Perhaps there were no enemies, so to speak, but he did have rivals who tried to arrest his rise. But those rivals to the claimants to the top fell short on one or other count. As early as 1960, the well-known newspaper editor Frank Morais had forecast in a book that Shastri could emerge as a compromise choice to succeed Nehru, though, as Morais noted, quote, he lacks an assertive personality, unquote. Morais records that he liked him instinctively at their first meeting because of his charm and modesty of manner and what he called a homespun Indian quality that the westernized Morais found compelling. His speech, Morais said, quote, was like him, precise and meticulous, unquote. Another journalist, the American Wells Hangen, wrote in 1963 a book titled After Nehru Who. He listed eight possible successors and concluded that Shastri was the person most likely to succeed Nehru. But he added presciently that Shastri's health might cut short his tenure. Hangen said of Shastri that he is, and I quote, the most authentically Indian of the personalities described in this book. He is nearest the mind and soul of India, unquote. It was more than that. In a party that had its fair share of scandal by then, Shastri not only stayed clean himself, but asked for action when it came to dealing with corruption or incompetence against Krishna Menon, K.D. Malaviya, and Punjab's powerful Chief Minister Pratap Singh Cairo. Shastri himself had felt compelled to resign in the wake of a couple of major railway accidents that cost hundreds of lives in 1956 when he had been the Minister for Railways. That principled resignation helped build his image when the accidents had marred his record as minister. On these and other issues, he had a sure political instinct. It is worth recalling Nehru's comments in parliament when he announced his acceptance of Shastri's resignation. Quote, it has been my good fortune and privilege, Nehru said, to have him as a comrade and colleague 
and no man can wish for a better comrade and better colleague in any undertaking. A man of the highest integrity, loyalty, devoted to ideals, a man of conscience and a man of hard work, we can expect no better." Unquote. Towards the end of his life, Nehru came to rely on Shastri more than on anyone other than perhaps his daughter Indira. And after the implementation what I think of what I think was the harebrained Kamraj plan, in which the senior most central ministers and most powerful state chief ministers had to leave office and work to strengthen the party, Shastri was the only one whom Nehru brought back into the government as minister without portfolio to help an aging and unwell lion in his winter. But there is no politics without rivalries. Press reports of the time spoke of active lobbying to induct Indira Gandhi into the cabinet as foreign minister. Besides, as things turned out, Shastri's formal brief as minister without portfolio was quite limited in scope, something that he was not happy about. And when Nehru wanted to make Shastri leader of the house in the Lok Sabha, opposition from colleagues who considered themselves senior to Shastri forced, forced the prime minister to drop the idea. Later, it was a feature of prime minister, the Shastri's prime ministership that through the bulk of his 19 months in office, there was subdued but latent tension with Nehru's family members. First, Nehru's, Krish, Nehru's sister, Krishna Hathi Singh, and Indira Gandhi sought to preempt Shastri's move into Teen Murti House here by saying that it should be made into a Nehru museum. As it happened, Shastri had never wanted a grand home as prime minister. In fact, he rejected both Hyderabad House and Jaipur House as options and chose to stay where he was at one Motilal Nehru place. The building next door, Ten Janpath, was tagged on as his office in order to handle visitors. Indira Gandhi would complain that though she had helped Nehru Shastri become prime minister, he did not consult her much. Against this must be said the fact that she got the portfolio that she had asked for, namely information and broadcasting. She was fourth in the cabinet hierarchy and named to all the important cabinet committees. Her place in the formal hierarchy did not stop her from trying to upstage the prime minister by traveling to Madras in the middle of language riots and making policy statements and to the border to mingle with soldiers during the war with Pakistan. Quizzed by the journalist Indan Malhotra, who wrote a biography of her, she said that she was not merely minister for information and broadcasting, but one of the country's leaders. And she asked Malhotra, do you think the gov this government can survive if I resign today? Yes, I have jumped over the prime minister's head and I will do it again. But it was clear that she was unhappy and reportedly even thought of settling down in England. Later, she sought to belittle Shastri as what she called an orthodox Hindu and therefore not someone with a modern mind who could take the country forward. It is also telling in its own way that on Shastri's death, Mrs. Gandhi suggested at one stage that the cremation be in Allahabad, not on the banks of the Yamuna in Delhi where her father's cremation had taken place. On her part, Nehru's favorite sister, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, hit out hard in her maiden speech in parliament. She echoed Atal Bihari Vajpayee's criticism that the government was indecisive, called her own party's government a prisoner of indecision, and asked, why is this government afraid? But there was a footnote to that speech because she immediately afterwards went to see Shastri in his parliament house office to ask him whether she had spoken out of turn. His dry reply as recorded by an official close to him was, Aapne jo thik samja, wo kaha. This reminds me of Oscar Wilde, who once said, the journalists are always apologizing to you in private for what they write about you in public. I didn't know that politicians did the same when it came to their speeches. In any event, for all of his ordinariness and the lack of anything approaching Nehruvian charisma, 
it was Shastri who was the man of the moment. Mankekar records that a clutch of party bigwigs, later dubbed the syndicate, had met at Tirupati in 1963 to discuss the post Nehru scenario. The Kamal reportedly agreed on Shastri as the next party president on the assumption that he would automatically become prime minister after Nehru. The fallback option as party president was the chief minister of Madras state, K. Kamraj, who was one of the confabulators at Tirupati. Mankekar says Shastri declined the offer of the post of president and Kamraj soon became party president in October of that year. At the following Congress session at Bhubaneswar in January, where Nehru had a mild stroke, it was Shastri who moved the main political resolution. Shastri could not have been unaware of the constant speculation about who would succeed Nehru. And we should not think that he was without ambition, which politician is. Nor was he without guile, as his actions showed on Nehru's passing. But like others who worked closely with Nehru, Shastri suspected that Nehru's real wish was that his daughter would succeed him, not immediately, for that would reek of dynastism, but after an, ignorant, but after an interregnum with someone like Shastri having a term. So when the time came to choose, it quickly became a question of Shastri or Moraji Desai with Nehru's daughter, a third possibility. At this point, as recounted by C.P. Srivastava, an IAS officer who worked closely with Shastri in different capacities, both before he became prime minister and in the prime minister's office, Shastri took the unusual step, Srivastava says, of calling on Mrs. Gandhi and asking her to lead the nation. She declined, saying that she was in too much grief and pain. Kuldeep Nayar, Shastri's press officer in the Home Ministry and someone who enjoyed Shastri's confidence recounts another unusual move. Shastri sent word through Nair to Moraji that Jayaprakash Narayan could be a consensus candidate and failing that Indira Gandhi. Predictably, as Shastri probably knew, Desai rejected both names. How does one interpret these moves even as Kamaraj, as the party president, was sussing out whether Shastri or Moraji had more support in the party. It could be Shastri's humility in looking for candidates other than himself. More likely, I think, they were calculated moves to make sure there would be no surprise candidates entering the fray. Now he is prime minister, and how do we assess his record? To do that, one must look at India in the context of the time. Very different from its more confident position today. The country had nurtured its democracy and created the institutional bulwarks for rule-bound government. But militarily, it had failed to defend its borders. Economically, it was trying to lift itself up by its bootstraps and create an industrial base but it was short of food to feed its hungry millions, short of foreign exchange, and surviving on the charity of other countries. Nehru's grand projects and schemes had delivered rapid industrial progress and faster industrial growth, but not the basics for the people. What is more, economic planning was about to run aground for want of resources. The country's socialist ambitions had produced bureaucracy-ridden controls and shortages. And as for foreign policy, while Nehru had given voice to an emerging bloc of post-colonial countries, Shastri did not have the stature to play that role. But what he could see was that some of the Western powers, especially but not only Britain, were willing to back Pakistan even when it was the aggressor. So international confidence in the country's future was low. From across the border, Pakistan's President Ayub Khan thought India would cave in if, as he said, it was given one or two hard blows. And there was more than one prediction by Western observers that the country would break up after Nehru or slip into a military dictatorship. 
This was the India that Shastri took charge of. His brief 19 months in office were in turn marked by successive crises, a drought that developed into a famine in Bihar and caused rampant food inflation. Violent protests in what was then Madras state over the imposition of Hindi, a decision that had to be withdrawn, a still underprepared military, corruption charges against ministers and much else. Even under, on Shastri's watch, there was a military setback when Pakistan tested India in the Rana of Kutch. India lost some territory through arbitration, while Pakistan came to believe that it could aim for a bigger prize, Kashmir. The saving grace was that the humiliation of 1962 could be wiped out by a qualified victory over Pakistan in the war of September 1965. But both the manner in which food aid was made available and the substance of the Tashkent Declaration showed how India's hands could be twisted by the superpowers. It was not an easy time to be Prime Minister. For such a troubled period in India's history, the country had a Prime Minister who was certainly not born to greatness. Nor can one say that he achieved true greatness given his all too brief tenure. But one thing can be said with confidence that greatness was not thrust upon him. Lahad Bahadur Shastri in 1964 had the experience and the ability to lead the country and the confidence to strike out in new directions as Prime Minister, even as the country was still mourning the death of a colossus. In his first remarks after being elected as leader of the Congress Parliamentary Party, just six days after Nehru's death, Shastri emphasized poverty and jobs as the primary issues that he would address. At a time of food shortages, his focus was on agriculture and then small-scale industry. One of the most capable ministers, C. Subramaniam, had been minister of steel and mines in Nehru's cabinet. Shastri put him in charge of agriculture. The resulting focus on agricultural research and new strains of wheat gave birth to the Green Revolution and eventually self-sufficiency in food. In industry, the new prime minister stressed the production of everyday goods used by ordinary people rather than heavy industry and said that existing capital intensive projects should be finished before starting new ones. At his first press conference as Prime Minister, he suggested that all government projects should mention the number of jobs they would create. This should be the yardstick on which to judge them. During the debate on a no confidence motion in Parliament, Shastri was quizzed about abandoning Nehruism and he said that Nehru's economic policies had themselves been different from the Mahatmas, and it was natural to adapt, adapt policies to change circumstances. The new Prime Minister was signaling that he was his own man. There can be little doubt that his economic policies would have had significant departures from Nehru's. In many ways, Shastri had always been a good foil to Nehru. Where Nehru was a thinker and dreamer, Shastri was very much a grassroots organization man. Where Nehru didn't suffer fools gladly, Shastri knew how to bring factions together and construct compromise. Where Nehru was the visionary who launched ambitious projects and strode across the world stage, Shastri knew that the common man needed jobs and clothing and health care. And Nehru's pursuit of a socialistic pattern of society was ideological. A contemporary observer noted that Shastri's socialism was more Gandhian. As the businessman G.D. Birla said of him at the time, not left, not right, but a good, clean man. Certainly, he knew how to exercise power and authority. He created the Prime Minister's office and with a powerful civil servant, a secretary to the Prime Minister. When Moraji Desai insisted that he be made number two in the cabinet, Shastri would not agree, and Moraji therefore stayed out of the cabinet. However meek and mild Shastri may have seemed, there can be no doubt that he would have progressively asserted himself. I'd like to cite three instances to show that Shastri did not dither when it came to difficult decisions. 
The first was after China carried out a nuclear test in 1964. Shastri was committed to using nuclear energy for only peaceful purposes, and he tried briefly to get India a nuclear umbrella from the Western powers. When he failed, he changed tack in early 1965 and gave the green signal to Homi Bhabha, who was head of atomic energy. The clearance was qualified, and the note said, and I quote, to begin theoretical work on explosions for peaceful purposes, end quote. Shastri added a rider in his note that, again, quote, no experimental work is to be done without my clearance, end quote. A few months later, during the war with Pakistan, China had piled additional pressure on India by issuing some warlike threats. Shastri's response to a, a possible Sino-Pak axis, as recounted by Homi Seth Nadurat Chengapa, was to ask Baba to go ahead with all nuclear preparations short of an actual nuclear test. In his book, Weapons of Peace, Shastri quotes the then cabinet secretary, uh, Chengapa, sorry, quotes the then cabinet secretary Dharmvira, quote, Initially, Shastri only wanted atomic energy to be used for peaceful scientific purposes, but towards the end of his life, he agreed that we have to be ready. We were not surrounded by friends, and we should not be caught unawares, end quote. India's progress towards becoming a strategic nuclear power took a very important step under Shastri. Second, the war with Pakistan provided a fresh display of the steel inside. India faced the risk that a Pakistani armored thrust across the ceasefire line at Chamb would lead to the capture of a key choke point, namely the bridge across the Chenab at Akhnur. Shastri readily gave the army the permission it sought to cross the international border and take the battle into Pakistani Punjab. That helped India's forces to cross the Ichogal Canal and threaten Lahore. In turn, that forced Pakistan to divert its forces away from the thrust towards Akhnur. That killed Pakistan's key war objective of getting to what Ayub Khan had called the jugular and cutting Kashmir off from the rest of India. It is notable about that war that unlike 1964, there was no political interference. The army was left to carry out its mandate as it thought fit. Shastri's stature rose and his catchy slogan, Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, found resonance. Vijay Lakshmi Pandit and Indira Gandhi now spoke differently about the Prime Minister. There was no more criticism about indecision. My third example concerns the devaluation of the rupee which for a variety of reasons had become inevitable by late 1965, not least because foreign exchange, foreign aid was made conditional on a devaluation. Senior ministers like C. Subramanian and Ashoka Mehta were in favor of the step. Shastri saw the need to take what he knew would be controversial, but the finance minister T.T. Krishnamachari was strongly opposed. Coincidentally, TTK came under attack from parliamentarians because of his family's business interests. Shastri had, in any case, been having a variety of problems with TTK and decided on a prima facie inquiry. TTK felt let down and resigned. That Shastri had engineered the resignation became clear from what B.K. Nehru, then India's ambassador in Washington, records in his memoirs. For when Nehru met Shastri the following morning, which was New Year's Day, the Prime Minister's first remark to him was, how did you like the New Year's present I gave you? Nehru went back to Washington with authorization to inform the IMF and World Bank that the government had decided to devalue. Shastri would have worked on the devaluation on his return from Tashkent. As things turned out, the devaluation was eventually announced by Mrs. Gandhi in June. Perhaps the one episode that can be weighed against these instances of responding to pressure with steely resolve is Shastri's decision in the Tashkent talks to give up territory captured in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, 
Most importantly, the Haji Peel Pass that connected Poonch in the south with Uri in the north. That salient was also a major point of infiltration from across the ceasefire line into the Kashmir Valley. Haji Peer had in fact been captured briefly by the Indian Army in 1948, but retaken by Pakistan. So its capture in 1965 had been a major triumph. In Shastri's defense, what can be said is that the Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire, which India had accepted, asked both countries to withdraw to the pre-war position. Refusal to give up Haji Peer or any other piece of captured territory would have meant flouting that resolution and failure in talks with Pakistan. It would also have created problems with the US, which had already suspended all aid. Such blackmail reflected India's weaknesses at the time. Mankekar and Srivastav, both sympathetic biographers of Shastri, record that before he went to Tashkent, the Prime Minister held extensive consultations with people in the government and in the opposition. The general view was that the country would not be able to hold on to Haji Peer, even if it tried. Shastri then took advance clearance from the cabinet to withdraw from all captured territory if that was required. Still, there had been critical voices, including the English, in the English language press, and the Janasang stood out for opposing even going to Tashkent, fearing the outcome, and remained bitterly critical afterwards. At Tashkent, Shastri initially resisted pressure from the Soviet counterpart, Alexei Kosygin, seeing that if Kosygin wanted India to give up Haji Peer, he would have to talk to a different prime minister. Eventually, though, he did give it up as part of the overall exchange of captured territory in return for a Pakistan promise to not resort to war. Kuldeep Nair, by now the head of a news agency, the United News of India, was on the spot at Tashkent and has recorded in one of his books that when Shastri met the media contingent at Tashkent, he was asked about Haji Peer. When Shastri said he had agreed to give it up, one of the reporters, forgetting that he was talking to the Prime Minister, blurted out that he was anti-national. Later, when Shastri called his home in Delhi and asked how the news of the agreement had been received, Nayar records that he got a negative response from his own family. It is possible that the stress caused by such reactions precipitated the heart attack that led to his death later that night. Dharam Veera, cabinet secretary at the time, argues in his memoirs that under the circumstances, the Tashkent agreement was inevitable, but that Shastri would have faced considerable opposition if he had returned to India alive. Quote, the fact of his death in tragic circumstances blunted the opposition, end quote. I now come to the what if, and I'm nearing the end of uh, my uh, remarks. Um, what if Shastri had survived Tashkent? You know, counterfactuals in history are a difficult proposition, so one really doesn't know. Uh, but it's interesting that Shastri himself once told uh, an interlocutor that if he lived for only another year or so, he would be succeeded by Indira Gandhi. And if he lived for three or four more years, his successor would be Y.B. Chawan, the defense minister. Shastri's survival and continuance would probably have resulted in keeping the Congress together. As a master of compromise, he might have found ways to deal with the syndicate, thus avoiding an open power tussle and party split. That in turn would have avoided the need for the sweeping nationalizations that Mrs. Gandhi effected in order to gain the upper hand politically, and a less contentious political climate would probably have meant avoiding the trauma of emergency rule as well. It is equally possible though, that a government under Shastri would have been forced by the difficult economic circumstances to take unpopular decisions, and that an impatient Mrs. Gandhi might have led a challenge from the left, supported by younger elements. If one considers how popular bank nationalization was when first announced, such a challenge by Mrs. Gandhi might well have enjoyed popular support. As for the outcome of such a challenge, it is hard to say. There were difficult times for India, and economic and political forces could have combusted in unpredictable ways. 
What of the other fault line in India's politics between those who would follow Nehru's hard secular line and the views of people like Purushottam Das Tandon, Govind Vallabh Pant and others who would have wanted India to reflect the reality that it was overwhelmingly Hindu? The answer to how Shastri would have seen it comes from his biographers who recounts how Shastri spoke at a public meeting in Delhi's Ramlila grounds. There, he joined issue with a BBC report to the effect that since India's Prime Minister was a Hindu, he would be ready for war with Muslim Pakistan. Shastri said at the Ramlila grounds that while he was a Hindu, the gentleman presiding over the meeting was a Muslim. One of the speakers at the meeting was a Christian, and there were people of other faiths present. Now I quote, the unique thing, a Koti Shastri, the unique thing about our country is that we have people of all religions. We have temples and mosques, gurdwaras and churches, but we do not bring all this into politics. This is the difference between India and Pakistan. So far as politics is concerned, each of us is as much an Indian as the other. To conclude, Shastri must be remembered as a man of integrity who invited trust. A teenager who gave up his education, his job prospects, and his family's financial welfare to join the freedom movement. A workaholic who successfully tackled naughty problems. A humble son of the soil, not a colonial wog. An orthodox Hindu, as Mrs. Gandhi called him, who also read Ghalib someone with whom the southern politicos felt comfortable even though he expected everyone to eventually adopt Hindi. Someone who could work simultaneously with such polar opposites as Purushottam Das Tandon and Jawaharlal Nehru and be respected by businessmen even as he espoused a practical approach to meeting the people's everyday needs. His combination of qualities was unique and his consensual approach would have had a good chance of keeping India on even keel. The country could have done without his untimely death. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for that highly enlightening lecture on Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri ji. Uh, Mr. T. N. Nainan has uh, very kindly agreed for a couple of questions. So we have time for, uh, yeah, there is a mic here. Uh, uh, since we have very little time, I would request uh, anyone who wants to ask a question to be very brief. Yes, please raise your hand. Yes, give it to her. Uh, I'm Dr. Jaya Prakash. Just my question is that there is the always when we talk about the Sastriji, uh, that after the war, when he uh, when he visit Tuscan and after that uh, uncertain death of uh, Sastriji. So just uh, I want to know about the, your remark about that. Because there is a movie also that uh, they are showing that there is a mystery of his death. So if you can give some enlightenment. Okay, thank you. Um, from everything that I have read, um, I'm not sure if there is much of a mystery. Uh, there are detailed, uh, almost minute by minute accounts of um, what happened that night um, from Kuldeep Nayar, from Srivastav, 
um, who, quest who talked to all the people who were present in Shastri's personal staff. And the fact that he was having a heart attack is very clear. Um, I think the issue was that his body had acquired a blue color at some point later. And that was explained by um, the, what was said was that the Soviet doctors had used a particular formaldehyde, I don't know what it was, um, which uh, was different from what was used elsewhere or their science was not that developed. And as a consequence, uh, with uh, the preservative to be used, his uh, body changed color and there was nothing more to it. I think the family was also concerned uh, and there were calls for an inquiry and so on. But I, I think it, he'd had heart attacks before. He had a history of heart attacks. He himself knew that he was in poor health. Uh, and the fact that he was having a heart attack and he fell down when he tried to go from his, um, you know, from his bed uh, to try and call someone and he fell down. Um, there was no calling bell at his bedside, which is a mistake. Uh, so clearly, uh, he, he died of a heart attack. So I don't think there's much of a mystery behind it. Thank you. Any other question? Well, it looks like that uh, uh, the lecture delivered by Mr. T. N. Nainan was so good that all of our questions have already been answered. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, now, uh, taking the program towards the conclusion, I would request the Vice Chairman of NMML Executive Council, Dr. A. Surya Prakash, to extend a formal vote of thanks, sir. Shri Ripendra Mishra, Honorable Chairman, Executive Council, NMML, <coughs> Shri TN9, the speaker this evening, Shri Sanjeev Sai, Director, NMML, uh, distinguished uh, guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of NMML, I would like to thank Shri Nainan for accepting our invitation and delivering the third lecture in the Prime Minister's lecture series on Lal Bahadur Shastri. Lal Bahadur Shastri is one of India's popular Prime Ministers and Sri, Sri Nainan has given us fresh insights into Shastriji's life and work. Uh, he was uh, Prime Minister, as the speaker said this evening, for just 19 months, but there were 19 power-packed months we saw the launch of the White Revolution, the Green Revolution, the 1965 India-Pakistan War, a Tashkent Agreement, and so on. As uh, Nehru's successor, he had to and he did disprove the doubting Thomases who wondered whether he would ever be able to fit into Nehru's shoes. But Shastriji never indicated that he was aware of the skeptics within and outside the country. And as Sri Nain pointed out today, even Pakistan learnt a bitter lesson in underestimating Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri. Shastri endeared himself to all sections of society. He was liked by all because of his simplicity, his common man look and demeanor. And uh, once again, a very big thank you uh, Mr. Nainan, for your lecture, and uh, I'm sure everyone here has uh, greatly benefited uh, from uh, learning about Lal Bahadur Shastri. Also, I thank our chairman, Sri Ripinda Mishra, for his guidance, and everyone present here for responding to our invitation, including Sri Anil Shastri, Sri Sunil Shastri, and members of the Shastri family. Once again, thank you all and very best wishes. Please join us for Haiti Outside. Thank you. <laughs>